Hello, and thank you for viewing this webinar on child anxiety, which is part of the Healthy Children webinar series hosted by the Early Childhood Team at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. The Saskatchewan Prevention Institute is a provincial nonprofit organization that aims to reduce the occurrence of disabling conditions in children through primary prevention methods. This includes raising awareness by providing information, resources, and training based on current best evidence. We believe that all children, regardless of ability, have the right to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. To further this goal, the Prevention Institute works in a variety of areas, including early childhood mental health and parenting, among others. And all of our program areas that work to promote childhood well-being have come together to form the Early Childhood Team. As a team, we are working collaboratively to enhance early childhood well-being so children have healthy relationships and opportunities to develop and thrive to their full potential. To learn more about this team and our work, please check out the information on our website. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is being recorded in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Madhav Sarda, a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Saskatoon. Dr. Sarda trained at the University of Saskatchewan and completed medical school at the University of Alberta. His practice involves treating kids of all ages with a wide variety of mental disorders. Dr. Sarda will present on how to help children cope with anxiety. And now, over to you, Dr. Sarda. Thanks. So, as mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about anxiety today. Um, and really what I want to focus on is making it a bit more, a bit more practical. Uh, so what I am going to talk about is what anxiety is and try to differentiate about when it is a disorder versus when it's just regular anxiety, because of course anxiety is normal. I'm going to talk a bit about, about when, where anxiety comes from and how it presents, uh, so you know where, where, where this sort of thing emerges. And then we're going to talk a little bit about treatment. Now, my goal with treatment is to make it practical and useful. I'm assuming that most people watching this webinar aren't treating anxiety disorders directly, but they're gonna be working with kids and families who are also anxious and having a few tools in your tool belt to help approach kids and families who have a lot of anxiety will help you make the day-to-day -day work with them go a little bit smoother. So that's what the focus is on. Uh, so we're also therefore not going to really focus a lot about on um, diagnostic criteria or you know anything like that. It's really meant to be a bit more straightforward and practical. But before we get into that, we have to figure out what anxiety actually is. Right? So anxiety is a reaction to a perceived or real future threat. So what that means is that you uh, the key thing in that is that there's a future threat. And that makes it a bit different than fear, okay? Fear is a response, both emotional and physiological, so your body's response to a tangible, real threat in front of you. So let me give you an example of how that might differentiate. It's the example I always use. Let's say that you go camping and maybe it's not the middle of winter and you're going camping, you open up your tent, you step out in the morning and there's a bear right in front of you. What you experience at that point is fear, okay? That's a, or potentially, presumably you're scared about it. So there's a tangible thing in front of you, a bear, you have to do something about it. Now, if the bear goes away, the fear goes away, right? The bear is no longer there. But anxiety, that may persist. You may be worried the bear might return, right? That's a future threat. You might be worried before you go camping that you might run into a bear. You might be worried you might run into several bears. The bears might be dangerous and scary. The bears may attack you, all of these things that could happen, at least in your head. So your anxiety is a lot more nebulous. 
it's not as tangible. And we can see therefore how it could be really helpful. If you're worried about running into a bear, you might take some normal safe precautions to prevent that from happening. Right? That would be a good thing to do. You might you know, not leave your food out. You might do some basic camping, camping safety things because you are a little worried about running into a bear. But you could become so worried about potentially running into a bear or several bears or, or have an unrealistic, you know, unrealistic concern or worry about it and therefore never go camping and never go into a forest and never go outside because you're so worried about this possibility. So in that way, anxiety is useful and it's adaptive until the point that it's not right i'm worried and anxious about failing my test and therefore i study for my test that's useful i'm worried and anxious about my test i'm so worried and so anxious i can't think straight i can barely continue to process i'm having panic attacks and therefore i don't study I avoid the test, I skip school, I failed the test. Now I'm more worried about my next test and I'm worried about what my teacher's gonna say, what my parents are gonna say. You see how this is no longer helpful. The anxiety stopped being helpful and started becoming a problem, which is when it becomes an anxiety disorder. Right? It's at that point that your you basic everyday run of the mill anxiety that everybody has, everyone has some anxiety, becomes an anxiety disorder when it gets in the way of you doing anything helpful. It gets in the way of you doing anything you want to do or would do otherwise. So if we therefore then look at anxiety disorders, the core feature, the core thing of an anxiety disorder, again, we're not really going to go through any, you know, DSM or like diagnostic criteria, I just want to give you the basic idea of what this is. The core feature of an anxiety disorder is the avoidance due to the anticipation of a threat. So you are avoiding something. You're not doing something because you anticipate something negative. And all the different anxiety disorders, we have heard of all kinds of different anxiety disorders. What all the different anxiety disorders really are, are just different threats. Okay, so in separation anxiety, you have the threat of something, something happening to the child or to the attachment figure, the parent. So that leads to the avoidance of separation from the attachment figure, right? The threat is something is gonna to happen to separate the child from the attachment figure and therefore they do everything they can to avoid that separation. And that's the separation anxiety disorder, right? Social anxiety disorder, that's, a threat of being embarrassed in some sort of social situation that you're going to be do something or say something or something's going to happen and you're going to be embarrassed. And for that reason, you avoid all social situations, right? Avoidance due to the anticipation of a threat. Generalized anxiety, that's a worry about a wide range of potential threats. You know, you could avoid uncertainty. You avoid novelty or new things. You avoid any trying to make mistakes. You're perfectionistic because you have anxiety over everything. Right? You have people who have specific phobias, so they might be scared of snakes and have worries that they might run into a snake, right? Now, we have all these different anxiety disorders, but in kids, which is what I'm focusing on today, in kids, most anxiety disorders are mixed. In other words, they don't suffer from just one single anxiety disorder a lot of the time. A lot of the times they suffer from multiple different disorders. They have like a mixed bag of a little bit of separation anxiety, a little bit of generalized anxiety, a few panic attacks here and there, maybe a little bit of social anxiety, but then all these things in a little ball. They're just like a little bundle of anxiety for these kids. So if that's what anxiety disorder is, the next logical question is how do you get it? And here, not how do you get anxiety, but how do you get an anxiety disorder or high levels of anxiety? Because everyone has some anxiety, right? That's normal. The first thing to know is that really bad anxiety and anxiety disorders usually start early. 
most kids with anxiety disorders have been born anxious. They're not necessarily born with anxiety disorder, but they're usually born more anxious than other kids around them on average. So, and it also tends to run in families. Anxious parents tend to breed anxious kids. And sometimes it's really hard to treat the kid's anxiety if the parents are also really, really anxious. There's actually a study where they had kid, anxious kids and anxious parents. And they took the anxious parents and treated their anxiety disorders and the kid's anxiety improved. They didn't always get totally better, but they did, their anxiety did improve just by treating the parents' anxiety. Now, there's a few things that are factors here when it comes to anxiety and, and severe anxiety being developed early. Uh, one is temperament. It's probably your most studied risk factor. So broadly speaking, what temperament is, like so broadly speaking, your personality is made up of your temperament and then the reaction and impact of all of your life events. So your temperament is kind of like your baseline of personality of what you're born with, right? And, you know, because kids are not born as some sort of blank slate. They are born with their own innate nuances and personalities. Anyone who's had two kids will probably tell you that their kids were different or are different. And they were probably different right from a very young age, right from their babies. They, they were just different babies. This is so common, even though they had the same parents, you know, um, and they, you know, they might be different in how, uh, how energetic they are, how intense they are, how rhythmical they are, meaning like, you know, some babies are just like, just, they, they, they follow a routine all the time, right? They sleep at the same time, they poop at the same time. They, you could even set your watch to how regular they are, right? Oh, it must be exactly 7.05 because they woke up again, no matter what time I put them to be asleep at night. So this, they, some kids are, are very much like that. Other kids uh, are, are, are a lot more intense or a lot more low energy or a lot more shy. So that's their temperament. And they're like that, you know, right when they get out of the womb, practically, you know, and what happens is that there's some kids who have a bit more of an anxious temperament, you know, so they, uh, they, 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 they're a bit more shy. They're a bit more fearful. When you show them new things, they tend to withdraw. They're slow to warm around other people. Um, they don't talk as much. They don't make as much eye contact with new people. They kind of like look at you out of, out of the corner of their eye, you know, just sort of looking up at you that way. They don't want to explore new situations. All of these things, the, the, that group of kids, the kids who have that type of temperament at an early age, they have a greater risk of developing an anxiety disorder. They're two to four times as much. Now, to be clear, just because you're born a little shy doesn't mean you're going to have an anxiety disorder. That's not how this works. You know, you can be born a bit shy and just be shy and that's okay. But if you're born a bit shy, there's more, there's a greater chance that you'll develop an anxiety disorder. And you can see the earliest stages of this as early as, you know, six months, maybe even three months. Now, there's also a lot of family factors that, you know, are correlated with anxiety disorders. Um, we know that parents of kids who are really anxious tend to have parenting styles that are a bit more overprotective or intrusive and sometimes negative. Now, in fairness here, that it's not clear based off any research if this is causative or reactive or both. What I mean is we don't necessarily know that overprotective parents cause anxiety disorders or if kids with anxiety disorders lead their parents to being overprotective. As you can imagine, if you've had a kid who, if you have a kid who's really anxious and who tends to overreact to every possible situation and is sort of always freaking out whenever anything new comes along because they're so anxious, your natural parental instinct is to protect them from new situations and new environments that might set them off in the same way that you may not do that for kids who, if you have another kid who's a lot more 
uh, impulsive and reactive and not shy and will go and do anything, you're not going to be as, uh, you might try and limit them so they don't hurt themselves, but th you're not so worried about the reaction to every new thing that comes up. So it's not clear uh, what causes what. It's just that that tends to be a style of parenting that emerges. And sometimes even if it didn't cause it, it may not help the anxiety get better. If you're really overprotective it, uh, or, or really intrusive, you, you don't let the kids sort of try new things to get rid of that anxiety. By that same token, uh, parents model anxiety and kids can learn it, right? And this happens at a very young age. You can see six months olds being, you know, held by their caregiver. And if you have a new person or some sort of ambiguous stimuli, so something that isn't clearly good or bad placed in front of them or a new person placed in front of them, the first thing that that six month old will do is sort of glance up at mom or dad or whoever their caregiver is holding them. And they'll see how their mom or dad reacts to that new person. And based on how their mom and dad react will be a, a bit of a template in addition to other things in terms of how they respond, right? Mom and dad are freaking out, then they feel like, okay, I should probably freak out because mom and dad are freaking out right now, right? So they, as young as six months old, they're looking to see what their parent is doing as a way to react, as a model of how to react. Clearly your life events can also impact your anxiety and your, and your level of anxiety. Anxious kids are more likely to have a history of negative life events. This is not you know, surprising, I don't think. Um, they also have a greater rate of bullying. Now, in fairness, again, it's again, not entirely clear what, whether that's causative or reactive. What I mean by that is certainly we expect that bullying would increase a kid's anxiety level, but also kids who are really anxious are easier targets for bullies, right? Because they don't fight back as much. And so uh, that it can go both ways on that that kids who are anxious might be targeted more for bullying, which in turn makes their anxiety worse, which makes them a bit more of a target for bullying and so on and so forth. Cognitive biases here refers to the fact that people with anxiety tend to think a little bit different, okay? And what I mean by that is they tend to have, uh, they tend to, if, if you would take an adult or a kid with anxiety and you sh put them in an fMRI, so a, like a fancy you know, MRI machine that, that shows the areas of the brain that light up you know, when, you, when you're using them. And you show them uh, a, a fairly ambiguous face, like a neutral face, as neither scary nor, 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 nor welcoming. You know? Compared to an average person, anxious people tend to view neutral faces as threatening. So someone without an anxiety disorder, they might look at that neutral face and think, yeah, it's fairly neutral. Someone with an anxiety disorder looks at that neutral face and interprets something negative. Same thing is true as if you then present them with a whole scene. And on that scene, there are things that are positive, things that are dangerous, things that are neutral. People with anxiety disorders will overly fo focus on the dangerous things in the whole scene relative to people who don't have an anxiety disorder. They tend not to focus they, on, on just those things. It's more diffuse. They, they, they see everything more clearly, okay? So if that's how you get an anxiety disorder, the next logical question, if you talked about what anxiety is and how it's different than fear and what's a disorder and how you get that disorder, the next is how does it show itself? And people with anxiety, you know, it shows itself in different ways. So you have your classic worriers. These are kids with anxiety who worry about everything, right? Sometimes I'll ask them, you know, what did you, what have you worried about so far today? And I'll say, well, you know, Doc, I see, I was worried uh, about coming here. I was worried what you'd think. I was worried if we'd be late. I was worried if my parents would make it. I was worried if we'd get in a car accident. I worry that, you know, if we, if we got into a car accident, then what would happen to the car? Would I be able to go to school? I was worried about missing school to come here. I was worried that what happens if I miss school, then I fail a class, and fail a class, and we'll graduate, and we'll graduate, and we'll, we'll go to university, because I can't become, uh, and that means I, I can't become an engineer, um, and I want to become an engineer, and I'm really worried about that piece of it. And so then, if I become an engineer, then no one's going to like me, and I'm going to have a job, and then I'm not going to, 
ever do well and then I'll, and then my life will always just be sad and like it's just like that's just like what they thought about this morning right you know sometimes i ask them how much of the day do you spend just sitting and worrying and you're really anxious kids with anxiety disorders you know they'll spend you know 80 90 percent of the day you know at least more than 50 percent of the day just sitting and worrying so over 50 percent of their waking hours is just just spent worrying about stuff they spend more time worrying than they do doing anything okay another classic question i'll ask them is you know, do you ever worry about how much you worry and that's like a classic question for people with generalized anxiety, right? People with generalized anxiety, they worry about everything. They worry about all the stuff they've talked about. They worry about that. And then they worry that they're worrying too much. It was meta worry. Classic. So you have your classic worriers. You also have people who present as depressed. First of all, there's a high rate of comorbidity here. What that means is that there's, you know, Lots of people with anxiety also have depression. Lots of people with depression also have anxiety. So this is really hard to, enter, to take apart the two. And you can sort of view them as, as very you know, overlapping and similar things in some respects, right? Now, sometimes the depression is worse. Sometimes the anxiety is worse. Sometimes the depression came first and they've been depressed for so long. They've been ruminating all the things they've got on in their life and all the negative stuff. And they start getting worried about things and the anxiety comes. Sometimes the anxiety came first and they've been anxious their whole life. They're always worrying about things. It's sort of paralyzing to be so worried all the time. And so therefore they get depressed because it's really depressing to be that anxious all the time, right? Traumatic events can obviously increase your baseline level of anxiety. That's normal, not normal, but the trauma is normal, but that, that's what you would expect to, to happen. And you can get to a point where your the trauma can hack can cause an anxiety disorder, right? And that, uh, and it could be a single trauma or it could be multiple traumas over a long period of time. ADHD here, I mentioned, you know, like inattention and lack of focus could be a symptom of anxiety. So sometimes, first of all, you have a high rate of comorbidity of ADHD with anxiety. So that means that more than you'd expect, people with anxiety are more likely to have ADHD and people with ADHD are more likely to have anxiety. But sometimes it's hard to tell the two apart because if you're really anxious and really worried all the time, it's really hard to focus because you're always in your head and that can make you seem inattentive, right? That can make you seem like you're not focusing. And the problem is that you're spending all your time worrying, right? By that same token, it's really anxiety provoking to have ADHD, right? If you're so disorganized, you can't focus on anything. Everything's happening around you. You're never on top of everything. You always feel so overwhelmed all of the time because your mind is always spinning and you just can't get, get focus on something to get going. That's really anxiety provoking and can make you really anxious. So these things, you know, one can cause the other. Social anxiety is also a classic thing for that, you know, like people with ADHD. Think about how much attention you have to put into a social gathering. Not that we have those anymore right now with the pandemic, um, but you know, if back in the day when we used to interact with people, um, you know, you might go to a party and and you'd see multiple people and they'd be in like a little group and they'd be talking and you know, think about the think about the focus you have to have there. You have to focus on the conversation you're having with one person. These two people over here are having a conversation, but you're ignoring that. You're hearing it, but you're actually filtering it out and not, and not, and not paying attention to that. This person has a nonverbal interaction with that person over there where they sort of meet eye contact. You note that. Someone else calls from the distance and says, hey, how's it going, Dr. Sarda? You have to shift attention, look over there, respond to them, then shift your attention back and keep up with what's going on without, having, without, without missing a step. In the meantime, there's music in the background, there's noise in the background, you're weeding all of that out and ignoring and not focusing on that while you focus on this. And now there's another nonverbal interaction here between these people because they shared a look and you're supposed to know that someone's looking at you. There's just so many things that are happening, which is why a lot of people with ADHD end up with social anxiety because they can't keep track. As they get older, they may learn to cope with that by drinking which isn't all that great of a coping mechanism, but that's why they might drink before they go to a party or while they're at a party because it just lowers their anxiety and then they don't care anymore, right? 
other ways anxiety presents, you know, aggression. Some kids who are really anxious can have huge aggressive outbursts. Think about it. People who are anxious often really want to have things in a certain way. They're very specific and they want things in a certain way and they like things in a particular order because that's what makes it easier for them, right? If everything's in the right place at the right time and no one's messing with anything, they're not as worried about it and it's a lot easier to cope. And when things don't go the way they're hoping them to go, they can have what we call these catastrophic meltdowns where they just melt down and they could have a lot of aggression with that. And then a little bit later, they, they, they calm down and they're just like these little meek kids are like, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I did that. I just got so mad. And just like, they, they're so distraught over what happened, but they couldn't control themselves when they exploded. Right? So sometimes that's anxiety. You can present your anxiety physically. Now, all of us do this to some extent. That's why we have phrases like, you know, I have butterflies in my stomach. Butterfly, because your stomach feels a little upset and you're nervous about something. We have a physical manifestation of our anxiety that's normal. Lots of us get headaches when we start worrying and are anxious too much, right? right? Some of us have a nervous bladder. You got to go to the bathroom when you get anxious. That's not unusual, right? So we all have some degree of somatizing, we call it, where you feel your symptoms physically. But you can have a somatization disorder where it becomes a big problem, where maybe you have something that's not your anxiety that's causing a symptom, but then your anxiety makes that symptom worse, and you can't stop thinking about that symptom. And when you're worried about that symptom, then you start thinking about the symptom nonstop, and that makes, things, makes that symptom not go away. Your stomach pain won't go away, because you keep thinking about it, get worried about it, and you're worried about other stuff, and you're still feeling it physically. Right? So sometimes that can happen. Pain as well. Sometimes anxious people will feel more pain because they'll fixate on it. They can't, they can't, they can't let it go, right? Sometimes people who are really anxious will present with school avoidance. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people, kids might avoid school. One of them is that they're really socially anxious, right? And they might not say they're anxious, but they can't go to school. As you dig into it, it'll turn out that, yeah, they're actually anxious. Is that, if you relate to that, there's anxious kids who don't appear anxious. And what I mean by that is that they, they say everything's fine. No problem. Not anxious. Everything's good. But then you look at their life, and the problem is that they're not going to school. They're not going out. They've got very few friends. They're not doing anything. In other words, they're not anxious. They're not feeling anxious because they're not doing anything that would cause anxiety. They've avoided, they successfully avoided everything that could cause anxiety. So yeah, they say, parents are like, oh, they have a really anxious kid. The kid's like, I'm not anxious, I'm totally fine. It's because they're not doing anything that would cause anxiety. If you ever made them do something at all, then, then you would see the anxiety, right? So those are, and there's more too, but there's like a lot of different ways that anxiety can present itself in addition to that classic worry where you might be thinking that someone's just really anxious. So then what do you do? What do you do when someone's really anxious in the room with you? And maybe you're not trying to treat their anxiety disorder, you're just trying to work on something with them. The first thing you need to do is calm yourself. Don't tell them to calm down. They can't calm down, that's the whole point. <laughs> if you just say, hey, calm down, and they calm down, this would, I would have no job, it'd be very easy. But you need to calm yourself down first before you can be at all helpful. There's a saying in medicine, just start with, in medicine, there's something called a code blue. And a code blue is what happens. You might hear it if you're ever in the hospital. You know, it's like code blue, 6200. They call it a code blue on the unit, 6200. Um, and what a code blue means is that someone's heart has stopped. And when someone's heart has stopped, they put a call overhead. And if you're in that area, if you're in 6200, you're supposed to run to that unit and see where the coat, where, where, where people with a heart, where the person is whose heart stopped, and you start CPR. The uh, you know people from the say say the ICU might become rushing in with a crash cart. That cart has things on it to help treat someone whose heart has stopped, um, and they'll run the code. They'll run the code blue, meaning by running the code, that means they're telling people what to do, when to do CPR, let's check the heart tracing, what medications to use, so on and so forth. And they say in medicine, you know, the, 
you know, kind of colloquially, the first pulse you take in a code blue is your own. You know, not, not the person whose heart stopped. You take your own pulse. Because if you in that scenario are you know, freaking out uh, and getting really angry and struggling, uh, not or you're getting really anxious, sorry, and struggling and, and not doing well, you can't effectively lead a code. You're not helpful to the team. You're not helpful to anybody in that setting, right? So, you know, for, for that reason, the same thing is true when someone is having an anxiety attack or is really struggling from an from anxiety perspective. You can't be very helpful if you're sitting there also being really anxious and being rural and saying, calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. That's not gonna help them calm down at all. Take a breath, take your own pulse, calm yourself down. Then and only then are you going to be useful to helping someone else. You might reduce the stimuli, meaning that you're going to, you know, can you get that person in a quiet room? Less noise, less lights. Can we turn dim the lights? Can we turn off the lights a little bit? Can we have less people crowding around them? Can we give them some space? Can we get them to a resource room or a quiet room or some place that is just less intense? You know, give them some time. It, it's hard to rush someone who's super anxious, right? You have to balance whether you sit with them or give them space. You know, different people have different responses. Some people who are really anxious will really benefit from having someone to sit with them and, and tolerate the anxiety with them. Other people are like, for the love of God, just give me some space. And they don't need someone next to them. They just need to get to a quiet room and have someone leave them alone for a bit so they can calm down. Um, and different people have, so you have to see with the person you're with, what they kind of need and how they respond. And if one approach isn't working, maybe you got to use a different approach. You can validate their anxiety. That's normal to feel anxiety like this. Normal to be where this worried. I understand why you're why this is so hard. You can help distract them if that's what they want. Something else to talk about, something else to do. For some people, you can help label the anxiety. Sometimes that's helpful. Wow, you're you're pretty worried about this, hey? Give some word to it so that we can talk about it. Sometimes when you have to do something, if they're worried about doing something, um, you can prepare them for it so they know what to expect. This happens in the hospital all the time, right? If you have a procedure that a kid has to go through, sometimes it can be helpful to sort of explain, okay, here's what's going to happen, just so you know, because you get rid of all that uncertainty, you know what's going to happen, uh, and you can expect it. Now, that's helpful sometimes. Other times for some kids, it's, it's not helpful. Preparing them, giving them too much information beforehand just means they can stew and worry on it longer and get more worried about it. And for those kids, you just have to, for some things, just rip the bandaid off. Like, you know what, we're just going to mention it when we need to do it and deal with it because you're just going to stew on it forever, right? So again, different kids need slightly different things. Different adults need slightly different things. You can help them calm down before or during the thing that's making them anxious. You know, if you're working with someone who you know is really anxious, you're probably going to want to plan for more time because they're going to take it up. They're going to be worried. They're going to have lots of questions. You're going to have to repeat information. See, one of the things that happens when you get really anxious and your, your sympathetic nervous system, so the part of your nervous system that really sort of drives your um, heart rate, make your heart rate go higher, make your blood pressure up, that, that gets really stimulated when you get really anxious. One of the things that it does, it tends to shunt information or it tends to shunt blood flow away from the front of your brain, from the frontal lobes into other areas of the brain. And that's a bit of a problem because your frontal lobes, this part right up here, this part is what's involved in uh, organizing and sequencing and planning, right? So if someone's really anxious, they're not using this front part of their brain as well as they could and they can't process information you're going to have to get them to calm down first. And you're probably going to have to repeat the information you told them multiple times. Maybe not right in the moment, because that might be really annoying for them. But certainly you'll have to expect that, you know, I'm going to have to tell, this, tell you this again when you're feeling calmer. In medicine, I teach you about that when you, when you have to break bad news, right? You're telling someone some terrible news, you're probably only going to get maybe three sentences in, three sentences in before they, their brain just shuts off. 
So you tell them the most important thing in those three first three sentences. And then you prepare for the fact that you're going to have to tell them a lot of that stuff a second time or a third time or a fourth. Because when they're freaking out and they're anxious, they can't process. So this leads me then to, okay, if that's the sort of general approach, you know, what else can I do about kids who are anxious? And to help with that, I'm going to talk about a few CBT techniques. Now, again, I'm not expecting that you guys are treating a lot of kids directly with anxiety. I'm not expecting you to be CBT practitioners who are doing cognitive behavioral therapy, but uh, there's a few, you know, aspects of CBT that you can apply in multiple different settings that might be helpful uh, in order to understand how to approach this situation. Okay, so one of those things, so first of all, CBT stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. And what that, what cognitive behavioral therapy is, is the idea that your thoughts and your actions and your emotions are all connected, are all interrelated. And what you think affects what you do, and what you do affects what you think, and what you think affects what you feel, how you feel, how you feel affects what you do, and the whole thing just goes into a bit of a triangle, right? An example of this might be, let's say you have one kid who is very depressed. I mean, yeah, usually use anxiety here, but, but let's say the kid is very sad, depressed. And they, you know, make a plan, despite their, their low mood, to go to a movie theater with, with friends. Again, this is in a non-pandemic time and we actually go to movie theaters. Um, but let's say they're gonna meet up with some friends and, and then go to the movies. Uh, and they make a plan with their friends and they go to the movie theater. The show's gonna start at 7.30 and no one shows, right? That kid, may their first thought, the first thought that pops into their head might be, they stood me up, they hate me. Now, if that's their first thought, then their first emotion after that is probably gonna be sadness. Maybe sadness or an anger, frustration. And then what they might do is sort of hang their head and go home and not wanna to talk to anyone out of embarrassment. So then they don't talk to anyone else later. And then they just stay in their room and stew all night about how embarrassing it is and they got stood up and how terrible they are and how bad they are and how they have no friends. And so they don't talk to their friends the next day at school and they don't talk to their friends later and their friends text them later and they don't say anything because they think that probably they'll respond because they're probably just gonna make fun of them. So then they don't reach out. And when their friends invite that person out again the next time, they, they don't go because they're just gonna get stood up again. So then they feel worse about themselves because they, because they, because they have no friends, but they have no friends because they're not going anywhere, reaching out, then their friends get frustrated with them because they're not going anywhere and they feel worse and worse and worse and they spiral and spiral and spiral. Now, imagine someone else in that same situation. They make a plan, they go to the movies, the show's gonna start soon at 7.30, none of their friends have shown up. And their first thought instead is, huh, were we all gonna to go to the 7.30 show? Or did we, or was it, or was it the 9.30? Or did, did we say Friday or did we say Saturday? That person may then text their friends. Their next action may not be to hang their head and leave in shame. They're, because their thought was different, they might, be a little, they might feel a bit more confused. They might text their friend. Their friend say, yeah, man, we're going to meet at nine. Oh. You see how that impacts their actions, their emotions, everything else that comes forward. Your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions all interconnected. And the idea behind the therapy, CBT therapy, is the idea that, okay, if we can change your thoughts, cognitive, or change your actions, behaviors, then we can change your emotions. That's the whole premise of CBT. And we're gonna take some of those techniques and we're talking a bit about exposure, relaxation, and simple cognitive strategies. But before we do that, we have gotta talk a bit about how avoidance breeds anxiety. I remember way back at the beginning, I said, avoidance, what anxiety disorders are, is avoidance due to a threat, right? Avoidance leading to some sort of threat. Um, so we, we, 
avoidance is the key thing about what makes something a disorder. And it's because the avoidance, avoidance makes the anxiety worse. Avoidance makes the anxiety better in the short term, but worse in the long term. Okay. So here's what's happening in this little diagram here. Okay. So you might have a kid, and let's say they want to go to school, but they're worried about school. They're anxious about going to school. Okay, so they're, they're cruising along, and it's time to go to school, and their anxiety just skyrockets. It goes way up. They're super anxious. They're breathing heavy. They're sweating. They're freaking out. They don't know what to do. So then they avoid going to school. They stay home, and their anxiety comes all the way down. Their avoidance made their anxiety better in the short term, but it's also taught their brain something. It's taught their brain that, they're, uh, that they were right to avoid that situation. Look how terrible I felt. And then I went home and I didn't go do that thing and I felt so much better. That was clearly the right thing to do. That thing must have been super, super dangerous. So the next time you are faced with that same situation and you're thinking about going to school, your anxiety gets even worse. It goes even higher. And then you definitely stay home and then, oh, I feel so much better. I'm glad I didn't go to school. And then the next day, the anxiety is worse and worse and worse. Avoidance breeds anxiety. So then what exposure does is takes advantage of the opposite. Now, the first thing to know about this is that one, even though here your anxiety went really high and then you left and didn't come go to school and your anxiety went down, it's important to know that your anxiety can't stay this high, can't stay this high forever. It cannot, it's impossible. You know, you'll have a heart attack if your heart rate keeps going at 150 beats per minute forever and ever and ever and ever. Eventually it's gonna come down. I mean, I guess little kids normally have a heart rate that's higher, but you know what I mean. Eventually your anxiety will come down because your, your body can't stay in that super stressed out range forever. Eventually it's going to diminish somewhat. I mean, I can totally relax, but it will come down. So you can take advantage of that because if you go into an anxious situation and you stay in that situation for long enough, eventually your anxiety will come down. This diagram says 20 to 60 minutes, and, and, but I don't want you to worry too much about the time frame there. It could be longer, it could be shorter. That's not the point. The point is if you stay here long enough, you have to stay here for a good amount of time, your anxiety will diminish. Let's use a different example. Let's say you're scared of heights and you want to deal with that scared fear of heights. So you start going up a ladder. You get up on the fourth or fifth step. You're feeling your anxiety really high. You're worried you're going to fall off the ladder, but then you just stay there. You just sit on the ladder. You just stand there. And you, get, you, you stand there for 15, 20 minutes, just standing there on the ladder, 30 minutes. You're going to get bored being on that ladder. And when you get bored, your anxiety is going to come down a little bit. So if your anxiety comes down a bit, here's what happens. Your brain learns from that too. So if you avoided something and your brain learns from it, your anxiety went up, you avoided it, the anxiety went down, your brain learned and made the anxiety better. The opposite happens here. If you sit in it and your anxiety eventually gets better, then your brain learns from that and says, hey, maybe that wasn't quite so bad. So the second time, you don't get quite as anxious and you come down again. And then the third time, you get not quite as anxious because your brain is learning. And that is how exposure works. That's using a behavior to reduce your anxiety. Okay, And that is a, ten, that's a general approach for all tangible things that you need to be worried about, like school, heights, meet on, sleeping by yourself, right? So the key behind any exposure exercise is to say, let's look at what you're anxious about. Let's create a bit of a hierarchy, what you're most anxious about, what you're least anxious about. And let's find the thing on that hierarchy that gives you some anxiety but that you can tolerate sitting in for long enough for your exposure to go down. And the key here, the key is you don't have to, you don't have to be totally relaxed. Your, your anxiety needs to drop by about 50%. If your anxiety drops by 50%, that's a successful exposure exercise. So, you know, I'll have kids, again, I'll use the example of school. 
you know, well, I'll, I'll first I'll give the example of the, I'll go back to the example of the ladder, I'll go back to school. So if you're worried about climbing up a ladder, you might go up to the fourth step and stay there and stay there and eventually get less anxious because you can manage that, right? Because if you went up to the very top, you wouldn't be able to stand there for 20, 30 minutes. You'd be too anxiety provoking. You couldn't manage it. You couldn't cope with it. So you go up to the level that gives you some anxiety that you can cope with. And as that gets better and easier, you go up to the fifth step and the sixth step and the seventh step. You, you go up a step, you know, do the exposure exercise till it feels, you know, 50, your anxiety drops from nine out of 10 to five out of 10. And then you climb down and the next day you go up to the, to the next step and you work your way up to increasing, increasing levels of anxiety. Same thing as what you do for the school settings. If you have a kid who is worried about going to school, you break it right down into what it is that is manageable for them. For some kids, they might be able to go to one class. You know, they're really actually going to school, but there's one class that's a little bit easier than the rest of them. Maybe they really like that teacher. Maybe it's just an easier class. Maybe they're really good at that class. Whatever it is, you can get them to go to that one class. So you start there. They still, but they still need to feel some anxiety. Otherwise it's not an exposure exercise. You're not exposing them to anything. So they can go to that one class. It gives them some anxiety, but they can get through it. They go to the class, they sit in the class, they get through it, they, they, they manage the anxiety. And then the next time that class is easier. And the next time that class is easier, and then you start adding. Okay, well, let's add the next easiest class. Okay, what if you go to a resource room and then that class? Okay, what if we go to a, that class, then a resource room, and then another class? You add, add, add. And you can break that right down into the smallest possible increments, right? So you can break that right down to, okay, you can't make it to a class, that's too much for you. How about you walk into the front entranceway of the school and stand in the front side entranceway after all the kids have gone to class. You come in afterwards, you stand there. Again, difficult right now because like we have all our separate entrances with COVID restrictions, but you get the idea. You can walk in, stand there, stand there for 20, you feel a bit anxious, you feel worried about being in school, but no one else is around, you wait there for a few minutes, you wait there until your anxiety drops to at least 50%, then you leave, come back the next day. That's a successful exposure exercise and work your way up from there. If, you know, if that's too much, I've had kids who have gone to the parking lot and just stayed in the parking lot until their anxiety dropped. I've had kids who circled around the school in the car until their anxiety dropped. It doesn't matter where you start with, as long as you feel some anxiety, then you can tolerate that anxiety and have the anxiety go down. And then you have to keep moving forward and keep adding. I always tell kids, it doesn't matter to me how fast you go. Most of these kids, if they're really bad anxiety, have been struggling with anxiety, like I said, their whole lives. So if we take an extra few weeks, so be it. It doesn't matter where we start. It doesn't matter how fast we move up the ladder, just as long as we go. Just as long as we don't stagnate. We can't stay at coming into the entranceway of the school forever. You want to do that for a couple of days? Sure but then we got to enter class or we've got to go in, we've got to up the ante somehow. You go into the front entrance way with everyone else, but you don't keep going to class. You just stay there while everyone comes in and leaves. You know, we find some way to work our way up incrementally so that you're not stagnating. As long as you're working your way up incrementally with greater and greater anxiety triggers, you'll make progress and it'll get easier. So that's the basic approach to exposure. Uh, for, for tangible things to be worried about. And you can do that with fear of school, fear of heights, uh, you know, kids who are sleeping alone, you know, you can, you, it's like, it's like re sleep training them like a, like a toddler, right? You sleep in the same room as them, then you're in the same bed as them, then you sleep on the floor, then you sleep on, you know, on the floor, but farther away from the bed, then you start leaving in the middle of the night, then you start, you know, staying at the doorway, then you're just outside the door, you sort of fade yourself back, increasing the exposure as they are able to tolerate it. So that's your exposure exercises. Then we can talk a bit about relaxation. Okay. Now, if exposure is about presenting yourself with an anxious stimuli and sitting in that stimuli until the anxiety goes down, relaxation is really about calming yourself down before you get anxious. So if I were to use the same chart over here, that would be exposure would be, you know, instead of going into the anxious stimuli, you know relaxation would be okay let's calm you down as much as we can before we go to school so that your anxiety goes way down here and then you go to school so when it goes up it doesn't go up quite as high 
right? Or doing things while you're in that stimulus to calm yourself down. There's lots of different ways to do relaxation. You guys have heard of most of them, I'm sure. So one is deep breathing. You guys know about deep breathing. One little trick to help with deep breathing. I always find it really helpful to uh, do what I call four, seven breathing, but the numbers don't matter. All that matters is that the second number is larger than the first. So it could be this four, seven breathing, it could be five, eight breathing, seven, 11 breathing, it doesn't matter. But the first number is how, is the number you count to while you breathe in. One, two, three, four. And the second number is what you count to as you breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. In two, three, four, out two, three, four, five, six, seven. The key is to breathe out for longer than you are breathing in. If you breathe out for longer than you are breathing in, you will disproportionately activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that is involved in rest and relaxation, basically, and you will make yourself calm down. That is the key behind deep breaths. Breathe in, first calm your breathing and slow it down so you're not hyperventilating because hyperventilating will uh, increase your anxiety. But you'll slow down your breathing so that you're not hyperventilating and also breathe out longer than you're breathing in. Progressive muscle relaxation is the idea of going through every sort of muscle in your body and tensing it and then relaxing tensing it and then relaxing it and then on your arm tense and relax tense and relax and you can get guided you know to people you know it's like a, a, a guided audio that guides you through that if you need to you can do that if you're sitting at a desk even and just sort of like flexing your toes and then relax them down flexing your foot and then relaxing it and clenching it up and um and so sort of progressively going through your body to relax yourself down before you do it. There's lots of you know guided mindfulness or imagery and things like that that can help calm someone down. Um, my uh, my oldest, so I have two kids. My my oldest one is six, and uh, he hasn't he stopped doing it lately. But for you know for several months, almost a year actually, he to help calm down before bed, we do a guided mindfulness um, through an app called Smiling Mind, which I'll get to at the end. And, uh, and it helps sort of calm, to, calm down before bed. You know, so his mind wasn't always worrying. He's a, my oldest one, my more, more anxious one. And so it sort of helps calm him down before bed a little bit. So then we can talk a bit about cognitive strategies. And, and there's so many of them. I'm just gonna highlight a couple because we only have so much time. But uh, one thing I like doing is a, is a worry box. This, that's really helpful for the really young kids. Um, but I kind of, for the really young kids, you can make your intangible worry, so like your more nebulous worry to something tangible. The idea behind a worry box is, okay, so I know you're really worried about this. This here, this here is a box, okay? This box, whatever you put in this box, we're gonna keep, it's gonna keep whatever's in it safe. So I'm gonna open the box and I'd like you to take your worry and put it in this box. And we're going to take that box and we're going to put it away for now. And you can have it back whenever you want it. Whenever you want to worry about it again, we're going to give you that box back and then you can have it again. And you can take that worry out and put it back in. You can worry about it for a bit and then you can put it back in the box and put it away. It's the idea of making something that seems really nebulous and intangible into something that's actually tangible. Also a technique that worked well with my oldest one. Um, one time he was really worried about asking his preschool teacher something. He really wanted to remember to ask this preschool teacher something. And he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to do it. He was really worried about it. What if I forget? What if she forgets? What if this? It's okay. We put that thought. He literally took it. He put it in the worry box. I took the worry box. I said, I'm going to put it in my pocket. I'm going to keep it myself. And then the most hilarious thing was the next day. And then he settled, actually. He went to bed. <laughs> so the next day, we went to the preschool. Hilarious, he's like, Daddy, can I have a worry box now? Uh, yeah, sure. I just took it out of my pocket and gave him the worry box. He's just sort of popped the worry back in his head and I went in and asked the teacher the thing that he was worried about forgetting. You know, so that's the idea of the worry box. Worry time, again, is the idea that we're going to take our worry and put it into a, a feasible time frame. Okay. 
you know, remember how I talked about people with generalized anxiety sort of spend most of the day worrying, they spend over 50% of the day worrying, and not only that, but they also actually feel like they have to worry, that their worries serve some sort of function, right? They're worried about something happens, and then it doesn't happen, but then instead of being reassured, they sort of learn, they, they sort of take away from that, that, oh, it's a good thing I worried about that, therefore it didn't happen. They sort of feel their worry serves as a very important function for them. Um, and so we need to take that worry, we can't eliminate it entirely because they're too tied to it, but we can sort of consolidate it. We can say, okay, I know you're really worried, you're worried about all this stuff, but here's the thing, let's set some time aside to worry. You know, like, well, what's a good time to worry for you? Four to 5 p.m., you know, after school, before supper? Sure, let's do that. Six to 7 p.m., you know, after supper, but you know, uh, before we, uh, a little bit before bed, so you have time to wind down afterwards, sure. Whatever works. And that's the time where you just set aside to worry. We're not gonna do anything else during that time. That time is dedicated and protected. You won't have to do anything else during that time. All you have to do is sit in one spot and worry about all the things you have to worry. And if you catch yourself worrying at another time of the day, just remember, it's okay. You don't have to worry about it. We'll get to worry about that worrying thought later. Right. Which seems so esoteric, but like it actually works surprisingly well. This idea, okay, you don't, they feel like they have to worry about it instead, but don't worry, don't worry. You can still worry about it. We're just, we have a time set aside, especially for you to worry about it. And that makes it easier to let go of the worry. And now instead of spending 50% of the day or 70% or 80% or 90% of the day worrying, they're consolidating more and more of that worry into a, into a finite time period. They're controlling the worry. That's worry time. Now, uh, there's a few different uh, there's a few different books and uh, uh, and and you know uh, uh, <laughs> apps and, and things like that, that that you can use to to help with uh, accessing anxiety now. Um, I haven't really talked about medication um, on purpose because you know I, I don't think that anyone prescribing medications probably is going to be focused on this particular webinar. Um, but uh, in terms of accessing therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, I know that it is difficult in this country and in this province. It's hard to get good CBT. It's hard to get good therapy for kids with anxiety. And so if you're having if your kid that if you have a kid that's on a wait list or not getting the therapy or doesn't want to do therapy, refuses to take part in it. A lot of kids who just don't, aren't ready for that, are ready to do that work, are, are able to. There's other things that you can sort of use in, the, in terms of help along the way. Um, and to be clear, uh, in terms of disclosures, I have no, you know, some of these things are, 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 are you have to pay for and I have no uh, financial involvement with any of these. Um, they're just sort of things that I find helpful in my practice and that I use with kids. So I thought I'd share them. One is the What to Do When series of books. You can sort of Google them and, and it's like, there's a whole series of them. You know, what to do when you worry too much, what to do when you dread your bed, what to do when you grumble too much, what, grumble too much, what to do when, you know, uh, bad habits take hold, that you have know, or perfectionism, or um, they have a whole series of possibilities. The anxiety one is really good. And it's really geared towards the kind of 10 year old, you know, eight to 12 year old range. Uh, and it has a, has a lot of information about, it's, a little, it's almost a little worksheet. It's very easy to, to kind of get through. It, it explains a bit of the, the root of anxiety and gives you some practical strategies, and techniques to work with it. I often get parents to go through it with their kid. If there's a split family, I'll get both parents, you know, to, to go through it with their kid. Sometimes I've even had the, the parents bring it to the school. And so everyone's work, so everyone working with that child is talking the same language. You know, they can label it in a certain way. They can use similar techniques. So everyone's talking in the same language about what this is. So the what to do when series I find really helpful. Mind over mood is helpful for the older kids. It'd be really more of a, a for, for the more motivated teenager. You know, like some of the, some of the almost perfectionistic teenagers, they do both of this. You know, like they're so perfectionistic and but so anxious. Uh, and they're like real go-getters, uh, but, but they get so worried about everything and it kind of crushes them. Uh, Mind of a Moves, like a self-help workbook that, that kind of works through CBT techniques to learn to cope with your anxiety. And, and a lot of therapists will use this book as a, as a base for all the work they're doing. 
Sitting Still Like a Frog is a, is a book for kids um, about mindfulness. And you can use that book to help guide to help guide them through some mindfulness. There's some apps that are helpful. I use uh, MindShift that's uh, based out of BC. Uh, it's a great app with uh, information about anxiety, coping skills. It can walk you through a few guided uh, imageries and, and things like that. So there's a lot of coping strategies in there, ways to track your anxiety. So that's a good one to use. I use Smiling Mind. And again, like I said, it has some uh, mindfulness based, uh, some guided mindfulness um, for every age range from adults all the way down to teens to, to school age kids to preschoolers as young as three years old so they have different ones for different age ranges online going to anxiety bc you know is a great technique it's a great tool um i hope to get something like that set up in saskatchewan at some point in time here it'd be awesome to have more local resources on it but anxiety bc at least gets you some good strategies and things like that so that's mostly what i want to share today when it comes to anxiety um, Oh, this is a recorded seminar, so there's a webinar. So there's a few questions that I think uh, that, that Megan had for me uh, that other people had uh, shared and had listed. And so I can uh, go through a couple of them that way. Sure, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarda, for that wonderful presentation, um, for that introduction to anxiety. Um, one moment, and I'll just pull up the questions that I had kept from. So um, some of the questions that were shared with us, some, some people asked, what are the common pandemic related anxieties that are being expressed by children and how could someone talk with the children about those concerns? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that's a fair question. Uh, you know, on what, the one, first thing to keep in mind here is that the interesting thing is, is that with this whole pandemic, what we know is that the, the global level of anxiety has risen. Right? Like the basic, the baseline level of everyone's anxiety has sort of gone up a little bit. That's people with anxiety disorders, people without anxiety disorders, everyone's sort of up a little bit on that. So everyone's a bit stressed that way. And in that way, I don't think kids are unique or more anxious than, than other people. They're just, they've just increased as well because things have changed. Um, I would say that on average, uh, I would actually say that the increase in anxiety is probably greatest in adults. It's probably greater in adults than it is for kids. And so when I see kids with pandemic related concerns or pandemic, pandemic related worsenings, the, the most common thing is actually the adults in their lives are struggling more. Uh, and that is really that, that they're may having some more anxiety, but really it's the, it's the parents, it's the, it's, it's the whole system. It's everyone else's anxiety that's so much higher and, and they're feeding off of that. And also the adults around them who were previously able to be such great supports for them are just feeling more and more stretched and more and more, it's harder for them to be the supports they were before. And so those kids don't have those same levels of supports. Um, so that's the first thing that we see. The second thing that we tend to see a lot of pandemic related is kids who have had pre-existing anxiety or pre-existing, you know, any mental health difficulties and things have just gotten harder, right? Nothing's new, they don't have any new anxieties. I mean, they're worried about the pandemic, they're worried about COVID, but they're worried about everything. So like, that's nothing new, that's just another thing they're worried about. But the problem is they can't see their counselors often, or when they do, it's over the phone, or it's not in person, uh, or they used to have really supports, they used to do more activities, they can't do those activities anymore. They, 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 their, their previous coping skills aren't as, open as it was, and so it's become a bit harder. And I would say those two things are by far the most common. And there are some kids who previously didn't have anxiety, who now are developing a lot of anxiety related to COVID and things like that, but that's actually, I think, more the minority compared to kids who are struggling because the people in their lives are struggling more and they need to figure out a way to cope, um, as we all are, or because they just don't have the same access to things that they, uh, that, that they previously did. And that's been a real change for them. Um, and it's not new anxiety, it's just you have to find new ways of coping with that anxiety. Now, when we talk about COVID with kids, I think it's important to be as like, open and, and honest about where we're at, right? Because I don't think we actually help kids by, by you know, kids, kids are smart. They can see right through you, 
if you're hiding stuff, right? You know, and they're reading you, you know, so if you're super anxious, they're reading that right off you, no matter what you say. So I think being open and honest about where we're at and, and why we're having to do certain things and why we're wearing masks, like, you know, there is a virus, it's called coronavirus, it's called COVID, and we can tell them the truth that, you know, luckily, you know, kids, if, if a kid gets it like you, you're, you know, it, it's less likely that you'll get really sick. It tends to be more in some people than other people, but we want to keep everybody safe. And that's why we're doing these things so that everybody can be safe. The kids, for the most part, get that. You know, like my six-year-old is the anxious one. He gets that, right? He's like, well, it's the coronavirus. It's, I have a coronavirus, so I guess we can't do that. Maybe we can do this. He's a little disappointed that we can't have a birthday party, you know, the way we normally would. He's a December birthday, you know, coming up. And so, you know, we can't do it the way we normally did. He said, well, you know, maybe in the summer we can have a seven and a half year old birthday when it's outdoors and that's easier to do a couple things, you know? And, you know, that was disappointing, but then he accepts that because you have to be open about what the situation is and where we're at and just being calm and honest about where we're, about what's going on. And generally speaking, if we address things with kids in a calm and honest way, answering their questions to the best of our ability, saying we don't know what we don't know, and that the adults in their lives are making the best decisions they can to try and keep them and everyone safe. I think kids do really well with that overall when it comes to the pandemic. Great, thank you, that's great. Um, someone else, one other sort of pandemic related question was what are some implications of the pandemic for supports, interventions and treatments of anxiety of young people? Yeah, I mean, Initially, when it came out, we all had to adjust to a lot of, you know, online virtual kind of work. Um, and we've all sort of done that to an extent. And so on one hand, you have fewer in-person appointments. And, oh, it's always nicer to be in person. And so that makes it a bit more difficult. Um, and obviously, you know, from a mental health, what I'm talking about in terms of seeing counselors and therapists and stuff like that. Um, obviously, some of the th things that kids used to do as ways to cope, like some activities are no longer uh, safe to control the spread of the virus. Um, and that has impacted things. I can tell you the thing that I am currently worried about and what I'm most worried about um, is ultimately right now in Saskatchewan our uncontrolled spread of the virus. Um, because ultimately more than anything else, uh, a, a, an uncontrolled virus is the number one thing that's gonna impact our ability to deliver services. And it is impacting our delivery, our ability to deliver services. Um, when hospitals are full, as they are right now, as we speak, you know, as, we, as the Saskatchewan Health Authority is surging to create more capacity, um, it means shifting resources towards that. And when you shift resources towards that, you need to have less resources to other areas. Now, at the moment, when, as I speak, you know, the current surge plan doesn't involve a reduction in mental health services. I think it's a special health authority recognizes it's extremely important. But make no mistake, if there's no beds in the hospital, then for the kids who need that highest level of intervention, that's what my job is, right? Seeing kids in emergency, seeing kids with those highest levels of intervention, if there's no beds in the hospital, I have no place to put them. And so those highest risk kids are the ones that I am most worried about because if we have a hospital full of patients with COVID, I have no place to put kids who have other illnesses, including mental health illnesses. And I would say among all of us child psychiatrists, that's what we, we are anxious about right now and what these next few weeks and month or months are going to look like. So in terms of how the pandemic has impacted uh, delivery of services and, and impacts, there is some effects of, of, of reducing access. That was better when the cases were lower, as the cases, uh, as cases of COVID were lower, we're opening up and offering more and more. We started doing more in-persons again. Uh, and then as cases of COVID rise, Things shut down more and our ability to provide services both at a general level and most importantly uh, our most acute most sick for our most sick kids um, gets impacted and that's that's our stress point right now so um, hopefully we'll, we can over these next few weeks here curb the, the virus spread again 
um, that'll hopefully reduce strain and allow us to open up more services again, both at more general levels and at the you know, most acute levels. Thank you. I guess one question that stems from all of that is, what do you see as sort of the long-term implications for child mental health, child and adolescent mental health from the pandemic sort of into the future, even post-pandemic? So you have to repeat the question. I... Sure. Um, I think you froze a bit. Can you hear me right now? Well, we've frozen, Dr. Sarda. So unless you come back, I think we... Sorry. Sorry. Here. I just said, yeah, I, I, I think it's on my end. I'm still a little bit choppy here. Can you just repeat okay. the question? All right. So my question was, is what do you see as some of the potential long-term implications mm -hmm. for children and youth, even into post-pandemic? And how do you see as a way to kind of address or mitigate those, imp those impacts? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to crystal ball how this is going to go. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that, and I should reframe things a little bit for everyone here, is to keep, the first thing to keep in mind is that 2020 has felt like it has been a decade long. Like, but nine months ago, everything was open. We only felt the impact of the pandemic nine months ago. And we'll see what bears out to be true. This is going to be recorded, so people will see it other times. But the you know, the expectations that the first doses of the vaccine are going to be coming in in early 2021, with continued vaccination up all through 2021, and hopefully, we by the end of 2021, if projections hold out to be true, we'll have something approaching normality next fall. So what we're talking about is one year. Now, one year is a long time in the life of a child. Absolutely. But it is not a year that is, you know, irreversibly damaging for most kids. So, so long as certain things are kept true. Remember, the most important thing for a child is their family. And having their parents with them, present with them, as calm as they can be, having time together as a family unit, that is by far the most important thing that we can do for our kids. As much as we like to get them into activities, you know, I know for my kids, I'm like, wow, they missed a whole year of like swimming lessons. <laughs> it's like I was going to get them to swim and skate and all these sort of things. They sort of lost that window where we're going to be able to do that, right? Um, and now they'll be a little bit older and that's fine. But, you know, the most important thing we can do to mitigate that is to remember that kids need their parents and their families more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as we are there for them, that'll help them, help them get through any short-term disruption in their lives like this. Right. And everything else is secondary. Now, the broader concerns that I have, you know, relate to especially some of the kids who I'd say that are on the margins. What I mean by that is the kids who, you know, are struggling a bit, but with lots of support, they do good, but without those supports, they really struggle. Mm -hmm. um, those are the kids I think are going to be the most affected. They're the ones that benefited from having you know, more EA help and, they, and helping and having more of those supports. Um, and they're the ones that are going to struggle the most. And I think that the, the most that we can do is continue to advocate to get them uh, the best that we can right now. Um, and I think that we, to, to sort of make sure they, ha they have the supports that they need from that perspective, we have to find other ways of, of coping, other ways of getting activity as a group, as a family. Um, yeah, when we're spending more time together, you know, as a small, as smaller units through Christmas and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you'll find that as long as we replace some of the other things we did with some new things in a different light, kids are going to get through that just fine. The ones that I the ones that I worry about are those ones right on that margin that, that get the most benefit from our interventions. Um, and, uh, and I don't have a great answer for what we're gonna do for those kids other than as things lift and as we get the virus under control, we've got to really make sure we wrap up as best we can to catch those kids up. I mean, I know I've heard, this is not my area, but I've heard from the school system, the impact of you know, reading levels and things like that on kids who are, when the school was shut down for so long. Mm -hmm. um, 
and what I hear from them is that they can get the kids caught up. It's just going to take a lot of work mm -hmm. to get them there, especially those kids on the margins. So that's, that's how I view that. I think that people are worried about the sort of long-term damage to kids and there will be, I don't think kids are going to forget this, what happened here, but it's important to remember what's most important to keep with their kids. You know, they're not going to be able to go to some things they used to go through, go to, but that's okay as long as they have their families. Right. Yeah, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that um, if families and parents can kind of take care of their, their own mental health and sort of find ways for them to cope as best they can, that they're better able to provide the supports that the children need. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's sort of the, the primary um, questions that, that came up. So thank you very much, Dr. Sarda. That's been a really informative and, and helpful presentation. And I think people will find it um, I think reassuring to know that, that there are things that they can do now, but that there won't necessarily be lasting impacts that, that can't be addressed in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.